welcome everybody. Um, I still see a few people logging in, so we're gonna chat for a second or two as these numbers continue to climb as everybody logs in. I appreciate everybody joining us here today. I'm Shannon, uh, and we're gonna go through cross-training therapists for the care continuum. Essentially what this talk is gonna go through, um, we're gonna go through an overview slide in a minute, but many of us are tasked these days with treating patients uh, across several different environments or with several different reimbursement structures. So we thought putting together a quick talk on this today would be a great uh, great topic to give you a cursory overview of what it is uh, we're gonna look at. And then we're gonna talk about what's the same in these different environments and what's different so that we can pay attention to those, uh, uh, those elements. I'm Shannon Leem. I am a speech therapist housed uh, down here in, in the state of Florida and I am the National Clinical Director for Home Health Services here at Aegis Therapies. I've been with Aegis, it'll be 28 years this year. Uh, I was to also be joined by Patty Weike, but she's unavailable for us here today, so uh, we wish her well, but she's not gonna be available today. And then Nikki is gonna introduce herself. And I'm Nikki Calloway. I am an occupational therapy assistant by background and am a senior director of rehab for home health um, in our Minnesota market. And I have also been with Aegis, I think in May will be 22 years. So been around for a minute. Outstanding. All right, so I think I'm going to end my webcam so you all can focus on the, uh, on the presentation and not the dog who will ultimately come in the doors behind me. <laughs> so we turned him off. Um, so real quick, before we get started today, everybody's lines are on mute. Um, there is a chat feature or a questions section of your panel there that I encourage you to use as we go through. Shyla, our, uh, our assistant today, is going to be monitoring that and, and we'll pop in with any relevant uh, things that I need to pay attention to so that the questions are timely if we need to. But the second uh, element that I want to make sure everybody pays attention to is there are a lot of people on this particular call right now. Um, if you are sharing a screen with uh, a colleague or another therapist and that other therapist did not register, meaning they didn't give us their name, they didn't put in their email address, there will be difficulty with us giving them their continuing education because we use the uh, registration and the monitoring of the questions, the polling questions, the time in and out, et cetera to be able to uh, submit those particular continuing education, especially to ASHA. So we request right now, if you are with another participant and you're sharing a screen, perfectly fine. But if in the chat feature, you could enter that other person's name in the, in the chat feature so that we know that they're there. And we asked too, if you could provide the email for that other person who didn't register so that we can just send you the, the proper information. So you have it and we are, everybody's all covered from, a, a uh, continuing education standpoint, if that's what you're looking for. If you're not looking to get continuing ed for this and you're just looking to, to join in and hear the conversation, that's perfectly fine too, no need to do that. But I do wanna make sure everybody understands to let us know if you're sharing a screen with somebody who didn't uh, register or didn't call in or didn't uh, uh, sign in with the, with the link that they received in the registration. All right, with no further ado, Let's go ahead and get started. So I mentioned briefly some of the elements we're gonna talk about today, one of which is the regulatory differences that occur between the SNF, home health, and outpatient settings. Those are the three major settings we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to describe the differences in treatment approaches that may exist uh, in the SNF setting or in a home health setting or even an outpatient. And we're gonna explain the required documentation elements for SNF, home health, and outpatient, some of the bigger pieces to that. And another part that we're gonna talk a lot about is collaboration and communication between and among those different environments and how it's important for the patient's transition that those things occur seamlessly and so that you're a part of that care team. So the first poll question that we have, we have a couple of them here throughout the, the presentation. So the first question I'm gonna ask here is how many here on the, on the line with us are treating patients across multiple settings? So when the poll shows up there in your banner, you're gonna have a choice to select A, yes, you do treat patients across, whether it's home health or and, and SNF or outpatient, or B, nope, you're only in one environment, but you're here to listen uh, about, the, about the different environments anyway. So A or B? Hey, Shannon. Yeah. 
Um, I've got a question. I did not see PT CEUs on the handout. Will there be PT CEUs assigned to this training? I believe, yes. Sh and Shiloh probably knows the answer to this, we applied for Florida uh, CEUs, correct, through CE Broker? Florida, California, and Minnesota. California is ex uh, accepted. Minnesota and California is accepted. Florida and Minnesota is still pending. Awesome. So what that means oh. is if your state has... I guess the best word is like reciprocity. If if your state accepts CEUs that are accepted by another state, then we have it approved for Florida, and then you can demonstrate for your state it's approved in Florida, and that would be on the brochure, and it'll be on the certificate. Um, Minnesota, I think, stands alone, doesn't accept others, so we got that individually. I think California is the same, which is why we uh, applied for those other two states. Great question. That's perfect. All right. And so now are we right. able to print off handouts? You can down in the really good question. I should have put that in in the housekeeping slide in the section of your banner there. There's a section for handouts and there should be three there, two of which uh, or one of which is the presentation and one is the uh, ASHA participant form for the bubble sheet. And I think the other is the brochure. So they're all there. Yes, you can print those out, have them, save them, share them, do whatever you like with them. And I think we have we have a complete tie with our poll. There we have 100% of people responding, which is close to 300 some people on this call. 150 of you work in across multiple settings, and 150 of you are only in one setting. So that's a really uh, nice blend there. So the first section, the first portion that we're going to talk about is the regulatory aspect. And within that, there's certain elements that we're going to talk about. So when we, when we talk about regulatory oversight, who are we talking about? Broadly, we're talking about CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, they're the, the, the granddaddy. They're the ones we pay attention to the most. Um, there's certainly other smaller state level um, regulatory elements, but broadly, when we talk about regulatory aspects and requirements and conditions of participation, we're talking about CMS elements. And then there's the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual. Um, if any of you are looking for a wild Friday night, I encourage you to read the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual for your particular environment. Uh, if you work in a skilled nursing facility, you can, you can Google that, Medicare Benefit Policy Manual, skilled nursing facility. Um, it's the same thing for home health. It's a really interesting layout of the rules of the road. CMS puts in writing, what are the requirements? What are they aiming for? What are the, what are the things that the facility or the agency needs to do to obtain federal monies for, this, for the patients that they serve? So it, it really is like giving you the speed limit. We talk a lot about, well, we wish when we talk here denials, et cetera, well, we are concerned with, well, it seems a little vague. Well, the actu in actuality, it's very, you know, very detailed. So pour a glass of wine, sit down with a 300-page manual and read very dry regulatory language, if you like that kind of thing. Maybe put on some Netflix in the background. It might help it a little bit. Additionally, in the regulatory oversight elements, we have private insurers that have a say in how things operate for their beneficiaries. There are state practice, practice acts that we talked about, administrative codes. And then surveyors, the survey element also comes into it. So you have the human element of the interpretation of those guidelines that are set out. So all of those things are the rules of the road that your facility or your agency uh, have, to, have to abide by so that they can receive uh, the appropriate Medicare, uh, Medicare um, reimbursement. So when we talk about site specific, we're gonna talk about conditions of participation, reimbursement structure for the different uh, environments we're talking about, qualifying criteria to be a patient, receiving services in those environments, the doc elements, and the communication and collaboration parts. So let's get dig, dig right in into conditions of participation. So again, these are like the rules of the road. It's the things uh, that the facility has to be able to provide uh, and the patient needs to be able to receive for the facility or the agency, in this case, we're talking about the SNF, will, will be able to earn that money from Medicare. So they have to be able to provide five times a week therapy for a patient, uh, and the patient has to require that. 
and six times a week for nursing. That's for skilled Medicare Part A, skilled nursing facility benefit. It's set up in a 30-day certification period, and the patient has to be under a doctor's care. There's other elements that are in there, but those are sort of the three big building blocks that are there. And I think a lot of you are probably very familiar with the SNF side of things, so I probably won't go into some of the elements of the SNF side with such deep um, uh, explanation because you probably know these really well, especially since PDPM came into play. You probably were introduced to many of these elements again or, or, or become refamiliarized with them, so I probably won't go into them a lot. Um, so that's what the conditions of participation on the SNF side say, right? Then on the COPs on the home health side, a patient has to require skilled care, right? The care has to be considered intermittent by either skilled nursing, PT, ST, or OT as a continuing service. Now, what we mean by intermittent is that the care that patient receives cannot be so aggressive that the home environment is not the right space for that care to be delivered in, right? If they need such high levels of supervision or care supervision or care provided that we are constantly in the home, we the provider are in the home with the patient, then that is not the right environment. It's better to then have them in a skilled nursing facility or potentially a hospital environment. So there are requirements as to the how many hours per week, and they're very high, uh, that the patient can receive care in the home. So, you know, even if you receive, uh, receive daily PT, you know, one hour a day, that's significantly below the number of hours they put as a limit. But the concept is it's supposed to be intermittent. They're supposed to have spaces in their care when they're in the home so that they can have time to absorb the care, perform any independent elements of that care, and uh, move towards their goals. There's a homebound criteria that must exist for the patient. Uh, the patient has to have, because of illness or injury, uh, a, a need to be able to stay in the home. Uh, and if they do leave the home, it's infrequent and it's a taxing effort. So there's there are elements that say, if we're gonna bring all of these services to bear in the patient's home, then this is what the patient has to, uh, the characteristics of the patient have to be. It's in a 60-day certification period. So we saw SNF was 30 days at a time or certified in home care. It's a 60-day period of time. And one element that we that's different than the than the, the SNF side is there's a medication review that's done, uh, certainly a comprehensive one that's done upon admission for a patient in home care where we go through every medication ordered. We look at every medication that's in the patient's home that the patient uh, expects to be taking. Uh, it's reviewed that they have the right doses and the right kinds and sufficient medication to meet their needs until their next refills are, are provided. And then at each subsequent visit, any clinician providing care to that patient must do a medication review. So that's PT, OT, speech. So it's not just the nursing element of a medication review. It can be as simple as, has any of your medications changed since somebody from the agency was here last? Um, and the, if the answer is no, then that's a quick medication review. It's checked off on your document and you move forward. But if there's any changes or concerns, then you are the conduit for that information to be passed on to certainly the agency so that they have a record of any medication changes because that's part of that condition of participation for the agency. And then to the physician, because many times the physician who's holding the home care episode, overseeing that home care episode, is not the physician that may be ordered that medication. So they that physician that's holding the episode needs to be aware of the meds that are changing for that particular patient so they can be informed. So you being in the home, you may be the conduit for that. PT, OT, ST, it's not out of your scope. You can rely on a nurse or the uh, somebody back at the office to assist if the patient has any questions. That doesn't mean you're there to serve as a resource but you're there as the conduit for the information. So it's a really important element to recognize. And then conditions of participation for outpatient vary. They can vary differently depending on whether you're part of a group practice, whether you're a rehab agency, or if you're a facility-based outpatient, right there, if you're in the SNF, you may have some of your th patients coming back to the uh, facility to receive care. So that's considered outpatient. And you can have up to a 90-day certification for Medicare Part B services. So that outpatient could be uh, 90 days at a time. So here we're going to have another polling question. 
So here's your for, here's your question. Does the absence of a car or a vehicle or the ability to drive automatically make the patient homebound for, or I should say the inability to drive automatically make the patient homebound for a home health episode? If you think yes, hit one. If you think no, hit two. So does the presence or the absence of a car or an inability to drive, does, does that automatically make them homebound? And we have 100% of people uh, responding, 94% of you said no, which, which is the correct answer. Uh, only 6% of you said yes. Um, the presence or the absence or the inability to drive uh, with a car has no role in the patient's homebound criteria, right? It's whether the patient can leave the home. It doesn't matter if it's in their own vehicle, if they have transportation, if they can drive or not drive. Um, it's the it's the physical characteristics, the the physical physiological response to an activity of leaving the home that's usually uh, the guiding premise behind homebound. So let's go into the reimbursement structures a little bit uh, for the different environments. So I put them side by side in this particular case so we can see these uh, for what they are. So we have the skilled nursing facility on the left, home health in the middle, and outpatient on the right. So let's take a look at what's the reimbursement structure look like. So we have Medicare or Medicare-like on the SNF side is usually, uh, is now reimbursed through the patient-driven payment model, PDPM. And I think I don't probably need to go through a lot of the PDPM elements. I think most of you probably can um, can give me a nice uh, tutorial on the PDPM elements. There are other reimbursement models within the SNF. There's sometimes a per diem payment or a per day for the patient. Uh, there's some that are from a private insurance that are patient condition levels, like uh, an advantage plan is the patient uh, falls into a particular condition level and that receives a particular payment for a period of time. Um, so there's different payment models, depending on your agency, you may, may be more in uh, the patient condition level uh, managed care approaches than you are in the PDPM. It just depends on your particular facility. In home health, for the Medicare and the Medicare-like patients, it's PDGM, patient-driven groupings model. Um, and again, it's patient uh, characteristics driving the care of the patient. So the number of visits, the number of minutes on the SNF side do no, uh, no longer contribute to the reimbursement. Doesn't mean therapy isn't paid for. It means that the, the volume of the services that are provided no longer drive the reimbursement for that care. Um, and then there's other payment models for home health, which is a pay per visit. Um, Medicare has a pay per visit element uh, to their uh, services. If you don't hit a particular uh, uh, number of visits in a particular episode for the, the category the patient's in, they get a low utilization payment adjustment, which is a LUPA, and that's a per visit uh, also uh, payment structure built into the Medicare side of things but other private insurances pay by the visit to the home health agencies. And then outpatient, generally we see CPT code um, uh, services uh, be reimbursed, timed versus service-based codes. You all are probably intimately familiar with those look like, uh, and the payment for those particular CPT codes vary uh, based on sometimes geographic coverages, based on uh, the time, based on the service you're providing. So it can it can uh, vary depending on the services you're providing. Hey Shannon. Yeah. What is the minimal criteria for a patient to no longer be homebound? Ooh, minimal criteria. Minimal. I don't. I don't. I'm going to interpret what you mean by minimal, um, meaning when the patient no longer has. Um, a, the patient is leaving the home regularly, so that would be one element, right? If the patient, even if the patient is wiped out, right? So I'm down here in, in the South, Florida likes to think we're in the South. So, or, or they say war slap out, they go, they go out to their doctor or they go to something for the day and they come home and they're war slap out. Um, that's a taxing effort, right? They're, they're fatigued. They have to take extra medication because they're gone or they sleep right through dinner, right? That would be a contributory, contributing factor to being homebound. 
if that still was happening and the patient continually still left the home, they went to bingo, they go to their daughters, they go to get their hair done, they then then they go to church three or four times a week, and then they go to um, get their nails done and they're they're going grocery shopping. So they can be they can have a taxing effort, but if they continually leave the home, that would be breaking the criteria for homebound. So they would not be homebound in that particular case. But if we're talking about the patient's improving, right? And so we're now we're thinking, are they still homebound? The patient is leaving the home a lot. They are describing um, minimal impact to leaving the home. Um, I would say you're probably edging on the side of they're probably improving, right? Homebound is a is a continuum. It's a transition. They don't go homebound to non-homebound in a in a light switch. It's a it's a process. But talking to the patient about when they do leave the home, tell me about it. How did it go? What did you experience? Were there any challenges when you came home? Did you have to take any extra medication, pain medication? Uh, did you have to wear your oxygen for the rest of the night? I would ask those questions to see how the response was to that patient uh, leaving the home. I hope that answered the question. A homebound is a is a continuum, and it's not a hard and fast answer. If the patient can walk 50 feet, then they're no longer homebound. That's not a criteria. That's not in the Medicare regulations. If the walking of 50 feet um, is easy, no problems, right? Then you kind of wonder, okay, well, let's let's try to go a little further. Are they are they not homebound? Can they get up and down in and out of the car just fine? Can they sit in a doctor's office for an hour waiting for a doctor's appointment without any major impacts? Then I would start to question, okay, are they really still homebound? Good question. Thank you. And thanks, Shyla, for picking me up there while that is still fresh on our slide. All right, so we're going to continue to move along. I have a lot of slides, so we do want to make sure we get to all of them. PDPM reimbursement structure, I think you all probably have this. I don't need to go into the case mix, uh, how it's created through the clinical category and the functional scores with uh, the speech component and the OTPT elements and the non-case mix uh, aspects. I think you all probably have a good understanding of it. The main thrust of it is is the driver of patient characteristics. What does the patient require? What is the patient's clinical diagnosis? What are the needs that they have? And in these particular elements, the PT and the OT uh, uh, and the speech portions do drive reimbursement in a different way. Um, but again, it's the patient characteristics, not the volume of services that are driving reimbursement. In the PDGM structure for home health, you've got four different areas there, the admission source and timing, clinical group, functional impairment, and the comorbidity element, which is what drives the payment. Um, so the admission source is the institution or community. Uh, where did the patient come from into the home health agency? Are they coming from an institutionalized setting prior to this, uh, skilled nursing facility, hospital, LTAC, et cetera? Um, or was it a community admission? The patient did not have an admission. They were just in their home. The doctor says, you need a little care. We're going to provide it to you. Uh, the lion's share of patients in a home care episode come from the community, not from an institutional setting. The timing of the episode, early versus late. The first 30 days of a home care episode are early in the patient's care. Late is every subsequent 30-day payment period after that. The clinical grouping uh, is the primary diagnosis related to the home, uh, the reason for the home care episode. So the uh, ICD-10 code will map into a particular into one of 12 categories. Functional impairment level <clears throat> comes from the scoring of the OASIS, which is the MDS, which is like the MDS on the SNF side. The OASIS is in the home health arena. Um, there are certain functional scores, functional questions that are asked on the OASIS, depending on the response to those functional mobility or self-care questions, the patient's functional impairment level is determined. And then the comorbidity adjustment. Does the patient have other factors other than the primary diagnosis that contribute to increased resource use that we might need to provide the agency with more money because the patient has other diagnoses that are going to color this patient's care trajectory. And that's the comorbidity adjustment. And it then should. I mentioned the lupa. Yeah. So should the therapist at the SNF level of care be making the decision about home health versus OP? My, my SW recommended a home health for everyone. 
Um, it, it depends. Uh, again, homebound. If the patient's in a skilled nursing facility, I mean, you can kind of make that determination. If you're working with the patient in the skilled nursing facility and you suspect that um, they are going to have an issue with being able to get out into the community regularly to receive outpatient therapy services. And by getting out into the community regularly, I don't mean the transportation. I mean, can they tolerate get up, getting dressed, eating, uh, doing all the things they need to do in the home to leave the home, then get into the car. So get out of the house, get into the car, sit in the car, ride in the car um, or in a transport, sit in the doctor's office, sit in the outpatient clinic, wait there until their appointment, receive the therapy services, <laughs> which can be 45 minutes to an hour, then get out of the office, get, get back in the car, ride in the car, drive the car, go back home again. Um, and if all of that can happen potentially a couple times a week, and you don't think it would be a taxing episode on the patient, then home care is likely the better choice of the two. In many cases, we can say if you err on the side of caution, err on the side on serving <clears throat> or getting home health orders and letting the home care agency decide if this, is this patient homebound, right? They're sort of the ones that can recognize whether this patient should or should not be on home care. And even if the patient's on home care for a short period of time, they can then transition into outpatient. Good question. Got one more for you. Sure. How does the hospital at home impact the reimbursement structure as far as an admission source? Oh, excellent question. I'm not sure. That, that's a very good question. I'm not sure how hospital at home, which is all the rage since COVID, right? There, everybody's wearing it now out of Paris, <laughs> the hospital at home element, um, how that impacts. That's a really good question. And I'm going, to, I'm going to do what most people in a webinar maybe don't do. They try to give you an answer. I honestly don't know. I don't know if that would be considered an institutional setting or if that would be community related. I'm, I'm edging towards it would be a community referral because they are not in an institution. They are not in an inpatient setting, which would me lead, would lead to the level of aggressive services, the, num the amount of services being provided and brought to bear to the patient. If they need it in patient, they would be there. And if they could receive it in the hospital home and in, in the home environment, it would be lesser. I'm, I'm leaning towards community, but honestly, I'm not sure. Good question though. And I'll see if, if I can find can the answer when Nikki starts talking. <laughs> can you describe, describe LUPA again? Sure, LUPA, Low Utilization Payment Adjustment is a LUPA. So there are 432 different payment categories for a patient in home health. And that comes from the admission source, the clinical grouping, the functional impairment level, right? All those things, all those different elements can interact to create 400 different, uh, 432 different levels of payment for the patient. Each one of those levels have a minimum number of services that need to be brought to the patient to receive, to receive an episode payment. An episode payment is a lump sum for every 30 days that's care is being provided. And for the sake of argument, let's say 1500 bucks. I think it's like 1800 now, or let's say 1500. So if the patient meets all those criteria and a certain number of visits, the visits can be from skilled nursing, PT, OT, ST, or home health aid. Any of those visits can contribute to that threshold to receive the episode payment. If we fall short of providing those number of visits, then the agency does not receive an episode payment. They receive a per visit payment, low utilization payment adjustment. So instead of an episode, a bigger bundle of money, they get a per visit. So and depending on the disciplines, it's 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 a hundred, maybe 120 bucks, something, 180 bucks, something like that, um, to for each visit for that the patient received, instead of the 1500 or the larger bundle of money. I hope that helped. Great questions. Keep them coming. Of course, with the number of people on this, we may never get to another slide. We'll just keep going through questions, but we'll keep going. The outpatient reimbursement structure, we mentioned it already. CPT codes, which are service-based or time-based. I think everybody understands the concepts are those. It's dictated by uh, CMS and the writers of the CPT codes, not by uh, us. We don't get to decide if, if we're going to uh, be paid based on the number of minutes. It's based. It's inherent in the CPT code. Um, there's also Medicare and insurance fee schedules. Uh, I think you probably hear about it from time to time where fee schedules are being altered and looked at by CMS. 
where there's a, a, a set rate for the different services that are provided. Sometimes we have prior authorizations and you can be in network or out of network depending on the outpatient uh, clinic and the insurance uh, you accept or don't accept. MMPR, which is the multiple medical procedure payment reduction, which came about oh, maybe a decade or so ago, I may be dating myself and getting that date wrong, but it's a certain element of the CPT codes build in a day. The, they get ranked and a portion of it gets reduced. That's what MMPR is. So it's to, again, not have lots of codes on one day to increase the reimbursement in a set number of minutes. And then there's the assistant modifier rates that went into effect recently. So all of those elements on the outpatient side of things. Now we're going to talk about the qualifying criteria. So now we're talking about the patient. What does the patient have to do or look like to uh, qualify for a particular benefit? And this is what CMS talks about a lot when they talk about right care, right time, right? It's making sure that we are bringing the right services to the patient in the right way in the right environment for the right amount of time. It's being good stewards of the Medicare dollar. So we want to make sure that the patient fits into the description of what the environment is that they're that they're being treated in. In a skilled nursing facility, we've got the three-day hospital stay criteria. <clears throat> and there are certain waivers that are going on right now during for the public health emergency. I am not going to talk about those waivers because we don't know if they're going to stay. Some of them are going to leave. So we'll bring them up right now. So the, the, the grandfathered elements are three-day hospital stay on the SNF side. We have a 100-day maximum, uh, which patients sometimes get confused with a 100-day guarantee. And that's not it, right? The patient has, still has to have a skilled need uh, for services, right? So that's the SNF side. That's what the patient needs to look like. Certainly tolerance is, is another element, right? Can the patient tolerate a certain number of services in a day, certain number of uh, minutes uh, of care being provided? I know there's no criteria, right? With PDPM, there's no criteria for the number of minutes, but there is inherent in it a level of assertive therapy services the patient should be able to um, tolerate to uh, be able to remain in that environment where, it, where it's beneficial for the patient. On the home health side of things, there's no hospitalization criteria, there's no maximum stay, um, meaning the patient can have unlimited consecutive cert periods. And I say that with a caveat because those two next two bullets still need to be in place. They still need to have a skilled service uh, required and the patient still has to be homebound um, for that no maximum stay, right? If the patient is still homebound and this patient still needs skilled care, then that consecutive uh, home uh, consecutive episodes is uh, okay. Documentation certainly should should support that. On the outpatient side, certainly no hospitalization criteria. We know we have a KX modifier for the cap. In 2022, it was $2,100 for PT and ST combined, and OT had their own bucket of money at 2110 as well. Hey, Shannon. Yeah. Do ER visits or overnight stays count towards the hospital admission days, or does it have to be a true hospital admission three days? Um, say that question again. Okay. <laughs> Scroll back. Uh, yeah. I think the question was something like, uh, if it's about emergency department use versus actual hospitalization, there is a difference. Yes. Okay. Do ER visits or overnight stays count right. towards the hospital admission days, or does it have to be a true hospital admission three days? Um, and I'm removing the waiver criteria from this, not my forte, knowing all the waivers on the SNF side. Um, but there is a difference between an, an emergency department use uh, and an overnight stay versus an actual admission. There can be a patient in the ED overnight and it's not an admission. And there can be a patient who gets admitted very quickly within the first half an hour. They've been admitted and they're going to be in the, in the, in the hospital, et cetera. So uh, there is a difference and Medicare does make a distinction with that. So 
I know on the home health side of things as well, they're in the OASIS, there's certain questions regarding resumption of care, uh, questions on the OASIS that ask about qualifying hospitalizations. So there is a distinction between emergency department use and an actual admission. Staying overnight in the hospital is not a surefire way to say, yes, it's an admission. The only way to know that is through the hospital records, is to know was this classified as an admission. I think we've all heard of patients that have been in the hospital for three days and it's just an observation period. They were not, they will say not admitted. It's not an admission. Great question okay. though. Has that changed with patients being in for observation versus admission? Orthos are now considered observation versus admission. Admission, does, can you speak on that? Uh, I, I can only speak on it in, in literally what I just spelled out. I'm My forte is not the sniff side and the criteria, especially with the, that element of it. Then also there's the rehospitalization rates, et cetera. But I do know there is that distinction between an emergency department, observation stays, overnights, et cetera. It has to be classified an admission for certain dominoes to fall in the Medicare world. So I would say, yes, there is a distinction. Great question. And we are, we are knee deep into our presentation here. So I'm going to keep moving. All right. So I'm we not, talked about, okay, I'm just, oh. I get, someone has lost okay. sound. There's a couple of things in here that someone has lost sound. I'm not sure. Oh, I don't know what to say. I mean, if you can't hear me, so I can't tell you to, yeah. to log out and log back in again, maybe put in there to have them sign out and sign back in again, click on the link, close it and click on the link and come back. That might be okay. the best way to solve it. Sure. Um, one thing we did slide in here is survey elements. In, in the skilled nursing facility, um, I think we've all experienced a, a survey when uh, you're on the in the skilled nursing facility side. They're in the building. They may or may not witness uh, things that you're doing with a patient. They may come and watch a session. They'll uh, be reading uh, information about the patient. Your documentation certainly is going to be in the record, so you're involved in a survey from that standpoint. But on the home health side of things, you are much more involved in a survey. You may actually be chosen by the surveyor to go on a ride along. When I say a ride along, the surveyor is not with you in the car, but they will meet you at the home of the patient and they will be there through the entirety, generally the entirety of that visit and watch all of the elements, not necessarily looking at you as a therapist and how, how your therapy goes, but how you do in the conditions of participation that the the agency needs to support, right? Are you uh, are you adhering to HIPAA? Are you performing appropriate infection control, a clean bag technique? Did you go through the drug regimen review appropriately with that patient? Is the patient familiar with their rights? Uh, is the home um, is the home folder appropriately set up for the patient for any particular information that they might need? So there's certain elements that a therapist may experience in a home health survey that you may not experience if you're in an outpatient or in a skilled nursing facility um, environment. So that's one element to pay attention to. All right, so now we're at a third polling question. So poll question number three, what should be the driving, what should be the driving characteristics to determining the Medicare benefit that the patient will be seen under? Is it the patient's choice, A, is it P B, therapist preference, C, patient characteristics, or D, financial determinants? And we have just, oh, we got people changing their answer, which is perfectly fine. Okay, I think everybody's settled in. We have some folks saying patient choice. No, patient. the patient cannot decide what Medicare benefit they want to use. They can't say, I want to be admitted to the skilled nursing facility um, and receive this care if they don't qualify, right? Uh, or they're not considered homebound and they, they say, I want to have Medicare pay for my home health. Um, they can't, right? They can choose to have it pay privately. So maybe that's the caveat for you folks that chose that. Maybe that's the caveat. They, you can pay uh, privately for a lot of things, but to have Medicare pay for it, the patient must meet the criteria. So it's C, patient characteristics. All right, Shannon, so now I think we're going to pick up. Oh, sure, go ahead. Um, will this be available to watch again? I would love to share with my staff. Um, I think 
are, we are sending out a link to the recording. Is that true? Yes, we do send uh, out a link to the recording. We can, if you will put the email in. I don't think that the uh, link or that the video goes to people that watched it, but it is available on our website if they're internal. Oh, okay. Um, no CEUs are available from a recording of it, but um, at Correct. the at yeah at the end of it when our emails pop up on it go ahead and email me and we'll we'll see what we can do for you how's that all right so here's nikki take it away nikki all right step one unmuting okay so next we're just going to look at the treatment approach considerations um through the continuum um you can flip to the next slide there you go so looking at the next step environment where are your patients now and where are they going um kind of goes back to what shannon was talking about when you're kind of determining maybe they're good enough to go straight from the sniff to outpatient maybe they need that home health stop in the middle um, from home health looking at outpatient from there so just knowing um, where they're at and what where they're going next um, and when is the next or the right time to transition to the next step um, what type of support do they have if they are going home do they have family that lives anywhere near them do they live with family all family out of state um, do they have paid caregivers that that live with them are people just popping in here and there they have a neighbor that pops in um, what type of equipment do they have um, in each different scenario if they're going home do they have walkers do they have shower benches do they have a wheelchair what are their equipment needs and then also the ability to practice actual tasks in this in the skilled nursing facility um, versus simulating what they might have to do. A big one with that is bathing, and we'll get into that here um, in just a minute. So the first section I believe we have, if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, is ambulation. So when you are in the SNF um, and probably outpatient also, when you're looking at your treatment approach to ambulation, you are looking at, from a structured environment. Most of the time, you know, you have uh, uniform doorways, level floors, um, you have all the adaptive devices that you can think or assistive devices that you can think of. You've got walkers, you've got canes, you've got four-wheeled walkers, you've got hemi walkers, um, all of those different things. Um, you have a lot of trained staff on site that can help um, with ambulation, walking programs, monitoring people if they're walking in their rooms, in the hallways, um, telling them not to get up without calling for help, you know, hanging signs, having call buttons, things like that. Um, the use of parallel bars um, in working with ambulation. When you are in a home environment, it's typically completely different than what you um, had in the SNF or the outpatient. So you, you have an, a varied environment. Um, the doorways can be all different sizes. You never know if a walker or wheelchair or anything are gonna fit through. Um, half the time the floors aren't level. Um, we've all been in that house where, you know, sometimes you can see through the floor down to the next level. Um, what are the floor transitions? Are they going from linoleum to hardwood to carpet? Um, what's the carpet look like? Is it shag carpet? Is it Berber, you know, Berber carpet? What's the thickness of the carpet? Um, do they have an assistive device? And if they do have an assistive device, is it broken? Um, is it in working condition? Is it hidden in the back of their closet? Um, does it fit into the bathroom? Does it fit through the doorways? Um, is their house cluttered? Do they have pets that often get in the way? I just worked with a patient today where every time he got up, the dogs laid right in front of him. Um, different things like that. Do they have help? Do they have caregivers? Is it the neighbor that pops in once a week? Do they have family that they live with? A daughter that calls every day? You know, what, what is their um, supervision or their, their caregiver help available? And then often those times, those caregivers aren't trained like we are or like other staff in the SNF um, or outpatient. So um, doing a lot of caregiver education. Um, next topic is transfers. Kind of goes the same way when you're in a SNF, you have a Hoyer, you have an easy stand, you have a standing frame, you have sliding boards. Um, again, trained staff, you have grab bars, standard surfaces. They have a hospital bed. If they can't get up, we're raising it up and they're getting up and down. Um, outpatient, maybe not quite all of those same devices, but standing frame, grab bars, pal parallel bars. Um, home health, often very, very different. They're often alone when they're transferring. Um, they don't have any assistive devices. Many, many different surfaces that they're getting up from. Do they have a recliner? Are they sitting in a, a hard kitchen chair? Are they sitting on a couch? Are they in bed? Um, how low is their toilet? 
um, different things like that that you just have to consider when you are you know writing your goals and what your treatment approach is going to be um, next one is bathing um, this is kind of what we were talking about before in the sniff um, every sniff is different I can't can't begin to tell you what what each individual one is for ones that I've worked at in the past they have a tub where you sit in a chair and then they lift you and put you into the tub and and the aides do everything for you some of them put you in a rolling shower chair and roll you into a shower room and then again the aides are doing the whole entire shower other places have individual showers in the patient room so it's a little closer to home again most of the time you're just walking straight into the shower or rolling a shower chair in there completing the shower again getting a lot of assistance um, those showers are usually scheduled they come in they say hey it's bath time we're going to go do a bath they have a lot of support with them um, in an outpatient setting you're usually simulating the task you're not actually having them do a shower it's going to be more simulating um, what they might have at home home health being totally different you know you're looking at do they have a working shower or tub do they have a shower or a tub are they having to step over the side of a tub do they have grab bars um, are they able to reach the faucets and control the temperature of the water on their own do they have um, a tub bench with a back without a back extended bench are they able to swing their legs over the side grab bars, um, handheld shower, non-slip mats, possibilities are endless with bathing. So just a lot of different things that you think about in those different environments of what they might need for the same task. Um, next one, dressing. Again, I'm at the sniff. You have aides that often provide a lot of their care. The aides are often walking to the closet, picking out which clothes they're going to wear, setting it up for them, encouraging them to change clothes every day or, you know, when they have soiled clothing on. You are often providing all of the adaptive equipment that they might need if they have precautions or that, you know, they can't reach their feet. Um, outpatient, again, kind of a simulated activity, not really probably all the time working on that specific dressing task, but simulating the activity. Um, home health, looking at a lot of different angles. Um, are they able to get up and safely walk to the closet? Are they able to transport their clothes back to whatever area they're going to get um, dressed in again? Are they changing clothes on a regular basis? Are they wearing a, appropriate clothes for the season? Um, do they have adaptive equipment available? Um, are they able to button, zip, hook their bra? A lot of the questions with the Oasis um, relate back to the patient's normal and you'll always see those patients who wear a house coat all day because it's too hard to put on a bra and too hard to put on pants that's not their normal so their dressing score is going to be lower because they're not back to their normal so looking at all of those different um, aspects from what before they went to the hospital before they got sick what were they doing how were they dressing compared to what they're doing now um Swallowing would be our next um, approach that we're looking at. In the SNF, um, standard nutrition, all of their meals are being provided to them at specific times and hopefully at the consistency level that the speech therapist has decided um, that they need to be at. So their food and liquids are set up for them with commercial grade thickeners or pureed, whatever their different um, food diet is they have a lot of people watching them they're usually in a in a dining room where there's a lot of staff and other people present so are looking for aspirations signs of choking things like that and then being able to um, have good sterilization options for the tools that uh, the speech therapist might be using to help with swallowing um, in an outpatient um, environment you are typically using pantry level food items and liquids not a lot of meal creation so kind of working with um, just kind of what they have home health um, fluctuating food availability you never know if the patients have food in their cupboards or in their fridge um, are the family and caregiver familiar with modifications that they have um, just because in the skilled nursing facility, you know, maybe they were on a pureed diet. That absolutely does not mean they're going to follow that when they get home. They have access to a lot of other foods that are not pureed, where in, in the um, sniff environment, it's a little more regulated. Um, and then just they have more limited sterilization for the different mirrors and other um, 
tools that they use for swallowing. And then also a lot of times people are eating at home alone. They don't have that supervision. So the risk of choking and aspiration is way greater because they don't have someone around um, watching them eat like they do in the other environments. Stairs. Um, Outpatient sniff, depending on what site you're at, you may not even have stairs. I know um, it's been a while since I've been in a sniff, but every sniff that I ever worked in, we had four stairs, a, a set of wooden stairs, four, that's it. So going up and down, up and down, um, majorly different than what you're gonna see at home. Um, at home, when they get there, that might be the first time they've ever done stairs. Do they have railings? Do they have a place to rest if they can't make it all the way? You know, maybe they have 15 stairs to get from one level to the next. Is there a good place for them to stop and, and rest or some place to hold on to? Um, just different in the home than in the sniff. It's always great in the sniff if there are like a bigger set of stairs and you know that people have 10, 15 stairs to take them to the, assuming it's safe, take them to the, um, you know, stairs maybe down to the basement or um, in the hallway or wherever where they can practice more stairs at a time to build up that activity tolerance to to be able to complete that task. Medication routine. Um, again, in the sniff, you are looking at the nurses bringing them their meds in a in a paper cup that they can take. They may or may not even know what they're taking, but the nurse brings it, says this is what the doctor ordered. They take it. Um, it's it's pretty much all set up for them. They don't have to think about it. They don't have to do anything. An outpatient um, doing more, looking at mock trials, probably having them practice setting it up um, on their own. And then in home health, um, like Shannon talked about earlier, medications are a huge um, condition of participation. We, we talk about medications at every single home health visit. Um, you have an immediate need to determine if the patients are able to do medications on their own or what level of support they might need. Do they have access to their medications? Do they know when to take their medications? Do they know what doses to take? Do they know why they're taking them? If they miss um, medications, do they know what to do? Um, if they're out of medications, do they know what to do? So just a lot of, of more problem solving and cognition that are involved in the home environment than in the SNF when somebody's not there to do it for them. Um, and then pain is our hey, last. Nikki. Yeah. Um. It's so, whoa. I just missed my. Uh, hold on, just a second. Um. Okay, I lost my question. It has gone away. So, let me okay. try and find. It. <laughs> okay. No problem. And then pain. Um. In the skilled nursing facility, again the. Nurses are providing those PRN medications, um, not always scheduled. A lot of times the patients may have to ask for them, but they are readily available. The nurses track how often they're taking them. Um, and then the patients are able to kind of restructure their day based on their level of pain. If you go to get them for therapy and they're in a lot of pain, they might tell you to come back later and that's fine, you go back later. Um, but a lot more regulated in the skilled nursing facility and outpatient, they are typically taking their medications before they even come to see you. And then you're using ice or heat or something after the visit to, to kind of help with pain. Um, in home care, we often see that patients' um, intake of food is limited by pain. If it hurts too much to get up and walk to the fridge to get food or to the microwave, stand in the kitchen, they just oftentimes won't do it. Um, also, pain is limiting their bathroom access. Again, if that mobility hurts, sometimes they just don't get up and go. Maybe they're wearing um, a Depends and they're going you know, in their pants because they can't make it there because it hurts. And then with that pain, then we see an increase in sores and wounds because they're not moving around. Maybe they're sitting in soiled um, garments. Um, and then also thinking about pain from a therapy standpoint. If, if the therapy that we are doing in the home is causing more pain, how much is that going to limit them with all of the activities that they have to do for the rest of the day? In the sniff environment, if they, you know, overdo it a little bit in therapy, they're probably gonna lay in bed longer or sit in their wheelchair for longer and not really do a lot of activity. But when they're home and they're in pain, they still have to take care of themselves, especially if they live alone. Um, so we need to keep that in mind when we're doing activities in the home that yes, therapy is important and yes, it's important to 
push your patients, but not to the level where they can't take care of themselves for the rest of the day or the next day or the next day until somebody else is there to help them. Um, and then again, teaching them how to manage their pain. So using medications, ice, do they have the cognitive ability to um, handle that on their own or do they need assistance? Thank you, Nikki. Perfect. All right. So the next piece is probably a really, it's enormous in the, in the minds of a clinician, right? How do I choose the frequency, duration, intensity, and potentially the goals for a patient in each one of these environments? And so the information we've given you helps set the stage for that, right? We've already talked about the frequency requirement in the SNF side. It's, there's a five times a week skilling element in home health. It's meant to be intermittent, meaning it's services usually are not provided daily. Um, so duration is how long something's provided. So we talked about certification periods already. But one element I want to bring back to the forefront of everyone's mind is um, it starts with the goals, right? You know, with goals and the goals are aimed at the next environment. If they're in the SNF, it's when they're what's the what's the step to get them to the home health into into home health or maybe into outpatient. If they're in home health, how, what's the next step to get them to outpatient? So you may not be choosing goals to solve all of their woes in one environment, right? You're not necessarily getting them independent when they're in the skilled nursing facility. You're looking to get them to the point in which they can get back to their home. And what is that level? We talked about caregivers, et cetera. The next piece of that, when we look at the goals, is breaking down that goal into the steps, right? We all know the interventions. What are the steps to achieve that goal? And now we need to bring forefront in our mind, does each one of those steps need to have a face-to-face -face interaction with a clinician? Maybe, maybe not. It's all dependent on the patient characteristics. In the home, this is an important part, right? When I'm not here, what can the patient be doing when I am absent from the home to continue to move this patient down the, the momentum of obtaining their goals? In the skilled nursing facility, when they're not in the gym with me or they're not working in therapy with me, what are the things they need to be doing outside of therapy with me to continue the momentum, right? Therapy outside of therapy, whether that's activities, whether that's restorative, whether that's talking to the, uh, the unit aides, whether that's talking to the family if they're in the home. In the outpatient clinic, they all, you know, the home exercise programs, do this between now and your next visit, right? We need to, every degree the patient moves in range of motion doesn't have to be made by the by the clinician, it can be made by the patient. So bringing that back into the forefront of our mind, does every one of these steps on the patient's care plan need to be a face-to-face -face encounter with me? If the answer is no, because you know the patient, you know the, their, the, the support, you know the skill that's involved, you can make those adjustments. You can then create that, uh, the frequency and the duration as a result of that. All right, so I saved one of the greater, the best topics for last, right? So documentation, it's always the end of a lot of these clinical talks that we have many times. Documentation kind of brings up the rear. So some of the elements, we don't need to belabor the skilled nursing facility side of things. Skill justification, medical necessity, always a hallmark of any environment. You ha it has to prove that uh, the skills of a clinician such as us are required. Medical necessity means that if I didn't come in now, if I didn't provide services, certain things could go wrong, right? What's the medical decline? What are the medical dominoes that could fall should I not intervene now? That's the medical necessity. Why now? There's care planning elements that need to be involved, right, of the care team. You have to support the primary reason for the SNF admission. There has to be some support of your evaluation of your services that speaks to that primary diagnosis to support the care in the skilled nursing facility. We all know about MDS collaboration, whether it's in person with the team or in your documentation or through the EMR. Plans for the next week or the next CERT period always should be laid out and mapped out. Uh, you should always know the next steps that you are expecting to do with the patient and you need to outline that in your document every time you see the patient the next plan is to do a b and c this is what we did today the skilled services i provided today this was the functional outcome of the services i provided today the change in the patient and here's what i expect to do next uh, and it's the next skilled progression and there's certainly weekly progress notes updated plans of care uh, and daily maybe daily interactions that are also documented 
on the home health side of things, first two still there, skilled nurse, uh, skilled justification, medical necessity. Then we also have a plan of care, the 485, which is the conglomerate, the the, the pull together of all the orders of uh, that are going to be brought to the patient in the home. Then there's OASIS performance and collaboration in the in the MD and the skilled nursing facility. We're contributing to the MDS uh, collaboratively. Somebody else is completing it. In home health, we as a clinician, a therapist, may be actually performing the OASIS. Uh, so there is a level of competency that comes with that. Certainly, we have to document to the homebound criteria that needs to be documented by every clinician every time, describing the patient characteristics that require all of these services to be brought into the patient's home. The drug regimen review we've already, ta already talked about, talked about the support for the primary diagnosis, plan for the next visit, and then we also have functional reassessments or reavows and research that come up in 60-day periods of time or in 30-day periods of time. Outpatient documentation requirements, again, first two, skilled justification and medical necessity, support for the medical diagnosis, whatever the medical diagnosis we're choosing on the avow. In outpatient, it's definitely standalone, so you, you don't have a lot of other elements that come into play uh, that skilled nursing might play a role in on the home health side or in the skilled nursing facility side. You, you might have a heavier impact of that on the therapy side for the medical diagnosis. You want to have support in your documentation for the CPT code quantities you are billing for those services. And we know that the plan of care, UPOC, and progress notes also come into play in the outpatient environment. Shannon. Yeah. Is it accurate that MedA does not require progress notes for each visit in SNF, but it is more so required by certain companies? Oh, and here they're gonna they're gonna hit my Achilles heel. Um Progress notes are still required. Um, the, the, the frequency of which is dictated by Medicare. Your particular facility, your particular state sometimes may require, for your state practice act, may require more frequent documentation by you as a particular supervising clinician, PT over PTA, OT over OTA or your facility may require more frequent documentation to support skilled services that's that's provided. If it's a policy that your facility has more frequent, then the more stringent of the two is to be followed. So if it's your facility that's requiring it or your company, then you would, would rise to that level. If Medicare is, is um, less stringent, um, it's good to know that, and maybe there's discussion to have, you know, discussions and reasoning why there's more frequent documentation being required over and above the Medicare criteria. Um, but the more stringent would always apply. I hope that answered the question. All right, so polling question here at the 11th hour. Is skilled maintenance a viable treatment approach in home health? A is yes, B is no. And we are coming to the very end. I apologize for running over. You all have great questions, though. We have 61% say yes, 38% say no. The answer is an undeniable yes. You can do skilled maintenance in any environment um, that is uh, the patient may be seen in. Skilled maintenance is an element of their benefit provided by Medicare and certain other Providers, uh, certain other um, insurers might also have a skilled maintenance element. You have to investigate that, but under the Medicare benefit, it is uh, viable in home health. You can do it. All right, communication and collaboration. So briefly, so communication and collaboration, you'll see at the bottom across all of these environments, especially if you're working in the SNF and you serve patients in home health and outpatient, and you might be following patients from and to these, you want to ensure that you maintain connections to and between all of these different uh, environments, all these different care teams. That's when the transition gaps close for the patient. That's when the care improves for the patients. So on the SNF side, when you have communication and collaboration, it can happen many different ways. You're surrounded by your care team members, stand-up meetings, risk meetings, QAPI meetings. They're, they're available, you have telehealth options, family and caregivers are coming and going in many ways. In home health, it must. it's typically much more um, targeted. You have to be intentional with your communication. It can occur in your ICC or an IDT care conference. It can be a remote communication, whether it's through the EMR, through phone calls, uh, voicemails, or other text uh, HIPAA compliant text uh, communications. 
um, it, you may you may be ships crossing in the night, coming in and out of the door of the same patient. You might have that brief three minute interaction about that patient that you're going to see. Or you may have an overlap of 10 or 15 minutes when you're in the home doing a, a small co-treatment with the discipline that's there to intertwine your transdisciplinary approaches. In outpatient, uh, you're, especially if you're housed in, a, in an ALF or an ILF, you wanna make sure that you have connection to the AL and IL customers. Uh, through that care team, through those nurses, et cetera. Physician connections, that's always a great connection when you're an outpatient. Who are the docs that could be referring to you? So you maintain that connection of value to them. Shannon? Yes. I have a, uh, I'm a PTA with 25 plus years experience and would love to know how students are being taught how to document and see a sample of your documentation as, as Aegis for home health. Some days I feel like I'm writing novels. Oh, that's, well, it, I'm a speech therapist. I don't know how to be succinct, as is very evident in this long running course that we're talking about here today. Um, uh, I, I, but I jest. Um, more words are not necessarily better words. Um, and sometimes that's the trap we fall into. Feel like you're documenting more, but you're not documenting what you need to. Um, get to the point. What is the, it, it's important to document what the patient is doing, but it's also important to document what I'm doing. So for every, if this is the only thing you take from this, for every the patient statement you write, you write a the therapist statement. So the patient ambulated 150 feet with a rolling walker with minimal cues and uh, circumduction. The therapist analyzed the gait and uh, provided cues at the hip and knee for dot, 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 right? For every the patient statement you write, write of the therapist. And I think if you get into that, this for that, you, you support the medical necessity, you support the skilled services, you're documenting patient performance, you're documenting where the therapy is going, and you're documenting the progress. I think it hits all those marks. Um, how students are being taught. I, I, that would be a that's a that's a discussion unto itself. Honestly, I don't know what the university criteria is regarding documentation for the different environments that the clinician might be in. And if it is if the, if it is being provided, it may be um, an an afterthought, maybe sort of a handout, maybe. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure. Um, I'm far removed from academia, so I'm not sure. But it's a good question. Briefly, I put this into the presentation. We don't necessarily need to go through it here, but home health orders look and feel different than the sniff orders you might have or in outpatient. If nursing is ordered, nursing has to open the start of care oasis. Um, and that is a condition of participation. It's a requirement. If therapy is ordered only, then nursing can open as a non-billable service, as a, as a service to us, as a therapist who's not doing it, or PT, OT, or speech can do it. OT can open now, they can do a start of care oasis if PT, skilled nursing, or speech is also ordered at the start of care. Uh, but OT still cannot stand alone. OT cannot st establish the benefit for a home care episode. So a uh, physician cannot write an order, order for OT home health, period, and not require nursing, not require PT, not require speech. They still cannot do that. That cannot be changed by CMS in a rulemaking process. That is a law that has to be changed. It has to go through legal, uh, other, other methods. Um, in home health, there's a VAL orders only. We do not have a VAL and treat. So before you provide your first visit, you must receive back orders from the physician, verbal or otherwise, to perform your first visit. And the discipline frequency must adhere to the Medicare week. So you often see orders written like this, 1W1, 2W2, 1W2, which means one week one, two week two, one week two, which means one time a week for the first week, two times a week for two weeks, and then one time a week for two weeks. Um, and that will tell you where in that Medicare week, typically Sunday to Saturday, each agency chooses their own Medicare week. Sometimes it's Monday to Sunday, most of the time it's Sunday to Saturday. So within that Medicare week, you're dictating how many times the patient will be seen. All right, we've reached the end to where you also are gonna see the session resources. This is the, the different things we used to create our talk today. Um, and I always encourage folks who work in different environments, um, hear those state operations manuals that I talked about here. So the skilled nursing facility state operations manual uh, and the home health one. It's always good to know the rules of the road in the environment in which you provide services. It's nice when you know the foundational 
uh, guidelines and guidance that are that's provided by the federal uh, side of things. So you can compare that when your customer or your employer says to you uh, uh, something uh, that sounds regulatory. You then have foundational knowledge that you can compare that to. Okay, is this now a facility policy that's telling me this, or is this uh, an actual regulation that Medicare says? Or you know, you may have a customer or your your employer may say Medicare says you can't do this, that, and the other. And if you know the guidance, then you can have a meaningful conversation to to discuss: is this a choice that the customer is making or your company, or is this a choice? Uh, or is this from a foundational standpoint that's that's regulatory in nature? So it's always good to have that as a as a uh, as a lifelong learner and a good steward of your of your care practice. All right. Um, for those of you who are receiving ASHA CEUs, you want to return that ASHA bubble sheet that we fondly call the bubble sheet. You're going to return that to Shyla.hamrick at aegistherapies.com. You'll see that in your PowerPoint and you'll see that here on the screen. Please return that within one week of today. So what is that? One week from today is January 25th. Please make sure you have that bubble sheet turned back into Shyla by January 25th. And then we will compile the information and we will submit it to ASHA on your behalf. Um, also take time to fill out the survey if you would. It helps us um, do better and, and serve, you, serve your clinical needs a little bit better. Uh, additionally, uh, if there's any questions, you certainly can send them our way. Here are our emails uh, here. Additionally, in that survey, if there's a topic that you'd like to hear, uh, somebody wax eloquent about it, <laughs> then uh, put it in that survey. We'd be uh, we, we'd like to hear from you. So we're going. I'm going to see if there are any. Uh, any other questions? That you all, a lot, a lot of great questions. I really appreciate it. You all must have had a great cup of coffee before get logging in here with with me. All right, yeah. I, I think folks are asking about OT and PT CEUs. ASHA CEUs are different, right? So that's for our speech therapists out there. You have to submit information to us. Uh, OT is passive. Shyla, I think, will uh, see your attendance and be able to submit that information to AOTA, right, Shyla? Uh, no, it's on the brochure and they submit to AOTA. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So on your brochure that has information, as always, if you if you have questions about what to do, here's the email. So go ahead and send an email if you have a question about how to submit. Uh, we they do anticipate, do I'm sorry, they, what? I will send out the certificates. Yeah. And then they will use that as well as their brochure to submit to AOTA. Outstanding. We do anticipate Minnesota and Florida not taking too long to um, provide us the approval. It's retroed, so we can provide this course, and it's retroed to today. So um, it's not beholden on. Uh, we couldn't. We didn't have to hold back this, the presentation until approval. It, once it's approved, this is uh, this course date is covered. The ASHA participant form, Joanna, is in the handout section. It's called ACDX0922-001. Do you all see that down in the handouts? Karen's asking for an official Aegis abbreviation list the, the, for documentation. Um, there is no Aegis abbreviation list. There is a Medicare approved Medicare <laughs> abbreviation list. However, I will say um, as an aside, there is a way to make your own abbreviation in any document. All you have to do is spell it out one time in the document and then put in parentheses the abbreviation you would like to use. And then any time in that same document, you can use your abbreviation that you just made up any time all day long. That's how you can make an abbreviation quickly. And now that we've got EMRs and tablets that have um, predictive texting, you can enter all of your great um, um, acronyms like that in your tablets, and then it'll print it out once for you, and then you put it in parentheses and showing this is now going to be abbreviated with these letters, and then you can use that abbreviation forever and ever in that document, in that one document. You can't do that for that patient for the rest of their record. <laughs> it lives in one document. <laughs> so, but that that's my that's my one little 
life hack, <laughs> documentation life hack for you. In the handout section, there's uh, three documents in there, Care Continuum Handout, which is a PDF of this presentation. There is the brochure that's in there and the ASHA bubble sheet should be in the handouts in your banner, your webinar banner, your go to meeting banner that's there where you see uh, your mute buttons, et cetera, the poll, where the polling questions were. Below that is a section called handouts. You may need to toggle the switch to drop it open and you should see three documents there. Fanny asks, why do you think OT can't stand alone? I think that had to do with when they created the, um, uh, when they, the, the comma that everybody's been talking about for 20 something years, where it says PT, OT, comma, uh, SLP, right? The, that element when they wrote legislation, that comma actually means something. Grammar means things in legislative language, legal language. And because they did that, they did not have OT uh, be able to, to stand in, in, uh, on its own. O AOTA is, um, ha is a fierce advocate for this, and we've made great strides. Uh, they've, we, I'm a speech therapist. They've made great strides in uh, lobbying to get the language changed, et cetera. So I do think in our lifetimes we will see it, but it's not here yet. All right, it has now gotten very dark where I am. <laughs> so I, I appreciate everybody hanging in there. Um, and if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate. Take uh, my emails right there. Uh, I will get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you everybody for joining. Have a great rest of your day.